All right, everybody. I hope you guys can hear us. We are back again with our weekly Wednesday Luft chat. And uh, of course, Bernard is here as well. Hello, everyone. And today we're going to talk about media, Hollywood and World War II. Now, to be honest, this is not the best title I ever came up with, but it's kind of, it, it kind of gets to the point. So something that came up essentially between me and Bernhardt the other day was this, this kind of talk about how World War II is being portrayed in media and Hollywood. Now, to be honest, media in this context right here, it's a very broad term. It doesn't mean per se journalism. It's just kind of media in, 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 in general terms. So we have print media, of course, we have games, video games, that is videos, uh, popular memory and myths, internet, World War II documentaries, and that's pretty much it. So that's our definition of media for, for the kind of the context that, that, that we're going to talk in today. And then, of course, also for Hollywood, uh, I'm going to pop a couple of examples here. You have a, you have a weird um, echo in the end of, of, of the word sometimes. Oh, do I? Well, I'll get a little bit closer to, to the mic. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of uh, examples here. Red Tails, Pearl Harbor, Battle of the Bulge. Um, I don't know if all of you have seen these movies. Maybe, perhaps, uh, some of them. Uh, they're not exactly great movies per se. Uh, but one of the things that, that Bernhard and me uh, saw the other day was a tweet by uh, Chuck Yeager. Now, if you don't know Chuck Yeager, he is one of the most well-known uh, pilots to have ever walked the face of the earth. He's still alive. He tweets regularly. This is actually my recommendation for, for all of you guys. Uh, check out Chuck Yeager's Twitter. It's at General Chuck Yeager. He, is, uh, he was an ace in World War II. And he's also the pilot who, or the first man to go faster than the speed of sound in level flight. He has flown a lot of prototypes and he is probably one of the most illustrious figures in modern aviation. And he has a lot of great content on his Twitter as well. Now, um, the, the, the tweet that he sent out is essentially that during some kind of event or dinner, I, I'm not quite familiar with the, with the context, uh, actual Tuscany pilots were introduced. This is of course the, the black pilots of the um, US Air Force during World War II and people just clapped. However, then a movie trailer for these pilots um, was released and people gave a standing ovation. And essentially, when I read this tweet, for me, this was, you know, inverse, the world was inverted. You know, Tuscany pilots maybe should have received a standing ovation. They did their service to the country and the movie trailer maybe should have just gotten a couple of claps. But that's, you know, suddenly the world we kind of live in. Now, this led kind of me to the conclusion, um, and I've been pondering on this question for some time, and maybe it's also something we can bounce off you guys and we can talk a little bit about. Um, but it seems whatever the soldiers did in reality, for some people, it is simply not good enough. And the result in all this kind of media that I gave, video games, video, um, movies, and so on, we beef up achievements for action purposes or just to make them seem greater than greater than human or greater than than man i guess uh invent achievements sometimes and lying about achievements and uh for example one of my examples that i would give here is red tails that completely skews the history of the tuscany pilots and does not really give credit to what they actually achieved by inventing stuff or by skewing what really happened and the conclusion kind of that I got to is that all of this stuff is essentially validating real human achievements by pretending they did things they didn't and not showing what they actually did. Anyway, that's kind of the, the basic I, uh, line out that we're, that we're actually going to talk about. So I'm just going to bounce it off Bernhard now and, and see what he thinks about this. <laughs> it's a lot of topics. Uh, I think there are some people um, mentioned in the chat that I'm way too loud this time. So Wait maybe turn, turn me down a bit. I, it actually kind of touches something. Yesterday, I will have a discussion in my comment section that somebody said, yeah, I don't talk too positive or I, I talk way too negative about German um, soldiers in World War II. And, and, and he made the point that they, 
that they were heroes. And I say, well, I don't, I don't use the term heroes. For me, it's a very emotional concept, uh, construction, for instance, mo mostly. And if you, if you say hero, for some people, they see Guderian. For others, they see Chuck Yeager, but others see Che Guevara. So this is always, for me, I, I usually don't tend to use the word hero because it's an emotional concept. Yet this is what people like to touch on and they make everyone bigger a shining light that you can touch him. I mean, this is kind of probably something that even democracies still have, which is actually usually a, a trait of totalitarian regimes. And right now we also see it, I think, in the, in the media, depending on the left or right, they usually always um, inflate their shortcomings and make the shortcomings of others bigger. So... The question is, is it a basic human endeavor that is a way natural? And the other way is, of course, um, who is responsible, responsible for making a correct portrayal? I would say, for instance, as I always mentioned, I'm less, I have less problems in fiction with it. Because everybody, I say, okay, everybody should be adult enough to know when he, go, he or she goes into a movie. Yeah, that's fiction, okay? Uh, I really have a problem yet with documentaries or people at, or history books or other stuff where they, they go outside of this. So I would make a clear distinction like, okay, is this movie, is, is this a documentary or is this a documentary with just impressions? For instance, there are a few documentaries I like. For, for instance, the one with um, McNamara about Fog of War because he talks about his lessons from the wars he fought in or he served in in, in, in which way or ever right whereas others often take um the notions of veterans at, at face value and they think okay it was this way and this is something of a different thing i mean the point of making something up or making achievements up or addressing them higher doesn't serve nobody because does anyone really want to take a claim for something he didn't do? I don't think so. And I don't think so, especially for veterans that have been through war for a very hard experience because usually they lost some of their friends, very close friends. And, and it's just a huge disservice to everyone, to them, to their friends, to their comrades, and also to their enemies. Yeah. Because I mean, essentially, what you're saying, or what I'm getting of of, of this, is like, if if we pretend like they did stuff they didn't, um, you know, on the one side it's invalidating what they did, but it's also um, an interesting take on the time they went through, as if the time they went through wasn't tough enough on them already, and it should have been even more than that, or that they should have been somehow better i guess that, that's a very bad way of saying it but um to, to go back of, to one of the things that you said is you know the, the talking about how difficult the time it was perhaps for the soldiers and so on i mean in, in a way it's it's something that also we see reflected in wartime propaganda which makes sense where you either pretend like the enemy is stronger than he actually is so that when you win against him it seems like your victory was all that better and I think the one thing that we can, you know, the clear example I have, for example, of World War II would be the Bismarck and the ship that went into the Atlantic and the whole Royal Navy or well, quote unquote, the whole Royal Navy went after her. And you can say, well, the Bismarck was a powerful ship, but was it really as powerful as nowadays we believe it was? Because there was a lot of propaganda built around the Bismarck by the Brits themselves after it destroyed the Hood, of course, which the Hood was a very important ship for the Brits itself. Um, and in, in a way, it maybe skews our image or like the correct image we might have about the Bismarck, but it kind of makes sense in that point. However, when we talk about it in movies and media from nowadays, um, there is the discussion of historically accurate, which we're not going to go into now, but there is that, that, that topic at the side of it where it is like, 
what is being shown and what is being uh, portrayed as what these soldiers went through, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, do you hear uh, some noise in the background in my case? Uh, I think it's a dog. No, actually, just let me fix this. Um, just talk on because I fixed the, the, the sink. All right, the sink is... <laughs> I actually, this sounds like a sink. Um, right, so yeah, that, that's essentially the, you know, the, the thing that I, uh, that I want to essentially get over here is it seems to me that sometimes, depending on who you talk about, you know, the human suffering people went through and in a way the achievement they, they had is invalidated by a cheap attempt at action perhaps, a cheap attempt to, to make them seem larger than life when in fact they were already larger than life. And by pretending like they did things they didn't, um, we're not doing them a service. Anyway, you know, if you, if you in the chat have, have, have a take on this, you know, feel free to, to mention it there. I already see quite a few comments there. That's awesome to see. Yeah. Um, oh, it's fixed. I, I'm already back. I just took five seconds. I had to reposition this, the, the thing that was dripping. So, All right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, um, what, what was your final question? I, I was a little bit distracted because I, I was really loud here. <laughs> <laughs> no, on, on the, in the one sense, you know, I said it, it makes sense to, to for prob propagandistic uh, reasons, it makes sense to sometimes um, beef up achievements or even to make the enemy seem more menacing than he actually is. Or weaker. Or weaker, Both. absolutely. Both. Yeah, yeah. Um, However, from a historical standpoint, from the standpoint that we have now, when we engage with history, going with that same flow, essentially, because I, I'm seeing it as, as the kind of same kind of as, uh, attempt, really, um, you know, to skew reality, it is essentially doing a disservice. I mean, I think we already came to that conclusion, both of us, in a, in a way. Um, yeah, the, the interesting question is for me, is, is there a need for this? Because I, I'm, I'm clearly aware that you and I, we don't really have a need for this, or it's, it's, it's not as profound as with other people. But the question is, is there a, maybe a psychological need for such stories, for such a narrative? Because there's also channels out there that are very narrative-driven and very people-focused, that, that tell, tell history that are quite popular. So, and... and and also there's, sto I mean, recently a, a colleague basically shared um, uh, a book, Storytelling for, for Corporations, I think. And, and I made a very negative remark, I think he removed it. Because I said, Geschichteldrucken für Unternehmer, which basically means, yeah, um, Geschichteldrucken means, um, yeah, a, a very negative way for, for seeing storytelling for for uh, entrepreneurs and and i know also from from rhetoric training that basically if people start to tell a story people pay pay more attention and some think that the human brain goes back into fairy tale mode into um the mode of a child and turns off certain critical parts of the brain and lets the story just sink in, in a way to manipulate it. And maybe this, this dressing up and all the other stuff also helps in this. So maybe there's a need for a story, or it's basically really bad manipulation. Well, in a, in a sense, I think there is definitely a need for a story, because you know, one of some of the oldest epics that we know about, it's usually about war and soldiers and heroes and so on. I mean, we have the, if you go back to, to the ancient Greek time, you know, you have the Iliad and, and, and you have the stories about Hercules and, 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 and all those epics. And then you go to the Roman age and it's the same thing, you know, you have all these, these emperors and somebody actually pointed this out in, in chat, all these emperors that are building up their memoirs from their conquests and so on. And that, but sometimes then pretended that the enemy was stronger than, they, than he actually was. So I think there is definite need for, for us humans and a definite interest also in war and heroics and larger than life figures and so on. That this, is, this is, I think, a clear concept that we see all across you know, the history of humanity. Um, the, the question really, you know, is, is 
when those stories are being told at their time, it probably makes sense. But now, given that we can share so much information between us, given that we can essentially, on a mouse click, find a sort of, mostly on a mouse click, you can find a factual um, article or a factional um, representation of what actually happened, especially during World War II, because there's so much data out there, that it, it seems really strange that we're still having movies that are seemingly catering to this fantasy narrative of what happened during these wars, during these times. And we're not being able to get away from that in a, in a way. Because it's, it's essentially, I, I would even say maybe we're returning even more to the fantasy realm the further we go away from, from the point in time that we are covering because, well, on a, in one sense, we maybe don't know much about it, but it also gives us more opportunities to superimpose things that maybe didn't even happen. I mean, there is an interesting idea I have. Maybe the thing is we all have all the facts at, at, at a matter of seconds, but you should not forget that I think a lot of people got hammered into them, not by saying, but by pure experience that facts are not interesting due to bad teachers or bad school curriculums. I mean, I remember there were quite many at a certain point, uh, quite many um, comments where they said, what's this? It's learning and it is fun because after all, my videos have a very data heavy approach, but a lot of people like them, obviously. So, and, and this could basically probably be some, yeah, some conditioning basically that happened at school. Very similar thing, which reminds me of what um, a German engineer told me once. He told me, 12 years long, you are getting told, don't ask questions, just copy what's on the blackboard and learn it for the test. And then when they get into university, the professors, they actually want the pupils or students to ask questions. But basically, nobody is capable anymore because they have basically been conditioned to just copy the stuff on the blackboard. And I personally had this experience in when I was teacher in Ecuador, when, when I left and one pupil said, you were the best teacher. And I said, and I said why? I mean, he was, I think, only 12 years old, but I, I always ask tough questions. He said, yeah, you were the only guy who didn't just wrote the stuff on the blackboard and said, copy that down, write that down. But you, you actually ask us and interact with us and try to teach us real English or, or ask us what is interesting for us and not just blatantly write down what's on the blackboard. Right, yeah. So maybe this, this disregard for facts actually or this, this conditioning that facts are boring is one of the driving forces that the narrative driven, the story, the hyperbole, the action, the greatest, the best, and everything is so interesting to so many people because the, the, the descriptive, which I call the descriptive approach where they just tell you facts, but without any, any relation to it. I mean, I, for instance, I've got taught so many stuff in school without a personal connection and it was uninteresting. Yet when I needed to use it in, in, in daily life, suddenly I could learn it way faster or understand it way faster because I had a personal connection. The main part I saw it, we had technical, um, technical high school and we all learned coding and programming there. And most people didn't like it, but this was central in our education. Yet when most of them joined the workforce and they had to code something which actually made sense, nearly all of them stayed coders. Yeah, yeah. But, but in school, actually, we disliked it. And we were, we were there on our own. This was a school where you didn't get in if you didn't apply and went to the um, process and everything. So this was a tough school, but we made it. And, every, and I realized the same. I didn't really like um, coding during school. But then when I worked for the first and I had to code the assembly, it was fun because actually it had a meaning to it. And this is mainly a problem with, with learning in school sometimes because it doesn't have a meaning to them. And I think with emotion, you create this meaning for the people. You create this drama, you create this action. And, and for me, for instance, I don't read fiction because I love information. 
for me, information is is the entertainment. Therefore, I don't I don't read fiction. I watch fiction and I consume it in many forms. But usually, I don't read fiction because I I read for for information for hard stuff. So yeah, that's, that's I mean what what you're saying essentially is that there are different types of audiences. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that the question is, I think we should also look maybe if if it's um, a conditioned thing, it is a nature or a nurture thing in a way. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's probably, you know... Because I always think about fixing under, under quotes the problem, you know? Yeah. Because we can say, okay, um, if we, we determine, okay, 90% of the population just wants a story, then okay, I say okay, that's that's bad. But if we find out okay, actually sixty percent of the people just want the story because they had been conditioned by schools that they dislike information. I would say okay, there's something we can change. I mean, in, the, in that case, it would be interesting to see you know who watches, what kind of demographic watches a. Um, Let's say, I don't want to say a cheap action flick in the sense because most of these movies have a high budget, but a cheap action flick in the sense that it is um, maybe not all that genuine in the way it portrays the soldiers' lives and it goes more for, for action rather than authenticity. And in, in some ways, events, uh, moments and events that didn't take place. And how many people watch that over how many people watch a movie like, let's say, Der Untergang? Um, which is qualitatively maybe of a higher standard in, in, in that sense. And is there an overlap? Because I can see people, you know, enjoying both, of course. Yeah. But where, you know, where is the audience? What is it being catered to? And this, of course, makes absolute, you know, makes a lot of sense when it comes to movies because movies have to make money. They have to bring in the money they, they spend on it, obviously, and they have to go beyond that. And that's, you know, why do some movies get a follow-up movie or not? Uh, well, that depends on the margin of excuse me the margin of profit it had so in a sense yeah i mean where where you know who's the audience why is that audience looking watching one movie or uh, or um even when we go back to to all those types of media that i listed you know who's who's who is uh, um consuming what type of media and for what reasons yeah and I think there's also probably an age thing. Younger people are more into the action hero. Younger people are probably more into um, a more fantastical approach, perhaps. Whereas older people are probably, you know, probably like more a thought out kind of a narrative. But that's in a, that's in a sense, um, you know, I think what we're gonna get at today. Um, so we're gonna, I think, open it up. Do you have anything else to say? Otherwise, we're gonna open up the, the q and I mean, another thing which comes to mind could be that that there's actually happening, but it could be wrong that we have a, a, a that the directions move move away from another. That there's a coming apart, like Charles Murray noticed for for a large part of the population in the United States. That, for instance, the upper class don't consume cheap beer, for instance. Were, uh, but only special brews and some other stuff, and the same could be happening with with entertainment in that regard, and that we are getting more extremes of both ends. And and in a certain way, my approach with my channel is actually to make um, to take academic information mostly and make it approachable for for basically everyone. I mean, there's a certain I, I don't actually want children on my on my channel. Or at least, I mean, of course, they are not, I, I don't drive them away in a way, but I would say, okay, there's certain topics, they are probably too hard to grasp at a certain point. I, I, I can, I'm, I'm too old actually to tell which age makes sense to, or is understandable my, my videos for it. So the question is always this, is also, can we, is there something, a catch all? And are there certain approaches actually better because you get more people into it, like common documentaries, which I usually dislike because they use cheap effects like music. And to a certain degree, depending on the country, a certain hyperbole or a certain way that that's a little bit slanted. Or is it always 
is this actually a better approach than making like a, a dumped down version and a, a high intellectual version that that basically there's more of a uh, that separates actually more people in a way that they approach the the war and everything differently so that they basically indirectly create a class in terms of knowledge and and perception of history all right yeah no that, that makes sense um right i think we're we're gonna go to the q a section now um if you ask a question please make sure to add military history visualized to the question and, and or myself um please note that bismarck is written with a ck uh, usually we see a lot of people just writing it with a k and then we'll sometimes won't notice the uh the question now one thing yeah I'd use the auto completion here add yeah. and then it will use the, the auto completion here yeah. Um, and please, you know, uh, be patient. There will be probably a lot of questions and we will go through them one by one. But anyway, before we go into that, it's, you know, you have your time to ask your questions, guys, now. Um, I'm going to ask Bernhard what he's working on right now, because I'm interested. Um, I'm, I'm working right now due to the, the, the timing on, on a video on the purchase of Stalin's purchase of the Red Army, which should be out um, next Friday. And this Friday there will be out um, the a clear video about what Blitzkrieg is or isn't, or basically, yeah, getting the straight facts. Uh, straight are the facts straight for the probably for the first time. It's because it's quite interesting how many bullshit is out there about the term Blitzkrieg and everything. Yeah, uh, that's probably a video that is really really needed. <laughs> yeah, and and you're working on. I am working on a video that will hopefully, thumbs crossed, or no, fingers crossed, come out tomorrow. It will talk about a misconception I often see on the internet and also in my comment section about uh, why planes or how planes are able to survive um, punishment. That meaning, obviously, when they shot, being shot at, um, you know, armor, toughness of construction, secondary protection, and so on. There's, I think there is a lot of misconception out there, and I'm trying to clear up a few things and. Maybe get something, uh, you know, get some, get something going there. Maybe uh, kickstart some kind of discussion on, on it. <laughs> anyway, um, I think we have the first couple of questions. questions. Yeah, we have one from Halfnia International. Um, for me and you, what do you think or know, thank the Bismarck in the end? As far as I know, the Germans blew it up themselves. And I think this was quite longly debated still being debated it's still being debated okay yeah uh, well, in, I, in, in a sense we we know we have looked at the wreck of, of course because the wreck uh, got found and we have found clear uh clear uh, well uh proof that obviously she was torpedoed and hit quite hard but we have also I, I i'm not sure if we found proof that she was actually scuttled or not but the survivors of the bismarck which there were not a lot because most of them drowned um, you know, they say it, she was scuttled and they, and it kind of makes a convincing argument as well. So it's probably a combination of the two. You know, would she have eventually been sunk by the Royal Navy yeah. if they shoot enough into it? Obviously. Um, did the scuttling make it faster? Obviously. So, yeah. So the next one is for you. What do you think, uh, what do you two think of Downfall? So it's for me and for you. <laughs> uh, I think it's a good movie. Yeah, I, I liked it too. It was quite, quite interesting. I watched it with a friend who didn't study history and he was quite shocked at, at various scenes. And I was like, what, what is the shock about this? It was, for me, it was like, okay, n not something new, but quite interesting because I thought he, he was actually well, well educated or so. So it's quite, quite funny. I mean, the other thing is how much, how much influence the video ha uh, the movie has nowadays a lot due to the memes. Due to the what is it the meme the meme video where Hitler freaks out about paradox releasing Hearts of Iron Four with bugs or something, so the question would be an interesting study would be um, how much this has a positive effect that people watch it and, and get a better view on it. There's also a question for our other movie: uh, Have we seen Torah 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 or Generation War? I have seen Torah Torah Torah. Uh, for the time, it's a very good movie. I have not seen Generation War. What about yourself? 
I, I wanted to order it last time, but I do it because right now my, uh, my, my advertising revenue is going down the drain. So I postponed uh, ordering the sport and Generation War. But at a certain point, I probably will watch Generation War and also might take make a video on it. But it's very controversial, it seems, for some people, especially from Poland. So I, I'm not quite sure. It really depends. So, um, there's one for me, why is Germany culturally suicidal and do you feel guilty of World War II? I mean, the question is cultural suicidal, well, it's what exactly you mean with that and, and the guilty of World War II, I mean, do you mean me or the Germans or everything? I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult topic in many ways. I don't feel guilty for World War II because I didn't commit it. So, um, and this is the, the main thing. I have, a, I have a real problem with the people that, um, that want to glorify it. And I also have a real problem with the guilt faction, as I call it. Because, I mean, there's guilt, uh, the emotional response, which I think is um, pathological if you have guilt for World War II now, if you weren't involved. Because if you can't take, you, you are not, you, you have no relation to it. And there's, of course, the, the traditional form, but also how can someone, a uh, descendant of someone, um, be guilty of crimes or something that his ancestors committed? Doesn't make in any sense. It also doesn't hold in the yeah. court of law. So, but the, very often there's a lot of propaganda going on from both sides and it, yeah it's 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 a minefield and i will always get a quite um pissed when people f say that i talk never negative about the germans or that i swallowed the whole guilt stuff and and i certainly know because i lived in germany and i talked to germans and most couldn't get along with my views which were way more relaxed than their ones i mean there was one incident where I made a joke. There were several Germans there and a woman from Poland. And she made a snarky remark to me and I made a snarky, snarky remark back. And it was, of course, about history, mine back. And she laughed. She almost laughed tears and I laughed. But the Germans were there in utter shock. <laughs> and if everybody and everybody who knows something about German and Polish history and Austrian history, I mean, she knows I'm from Austria. We fucked Poland over all the time. I mean, the Poland um, broke the siege of Vienna to a large part, yeah. And we didn't thank them in any way. We 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 drove away Poland, yeah. We cut it up and everything. And when she can laugh about it, and the Germans could be laugh about it too. But this comes down to something I read about jokes and. And jokes, there are two components, the truth and the painful element. And if you can't acknowledge both, you can't laugh about the joke. The thing is, I, as a historian, I both can acknowledge the pain and the truth. I mean, truth is subjective. And, and she from Poland could also, because she knew what, but the Germans couldn't admit probably one, one part, the pain or something or the truth, because this is always the thing if you... So a friend told me that if you make a joke about a very, um, such a topic, this also means that you acknowledge that it happened. And some people can't even acknowledge that. That doesn't mean that they are deniers of it, but they just can't or won't deal with it. And this is the reason why I think if you can't make jokes about certain aspects, unless you were directly involved and traumatized, this is an exception. Then you have a real problem and you should see a therapist. If it's right. I think that's therapist. answered. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that's answered uh, twice over. But I think one of the things that um, you should also, if you guys meet Germans, uh, you should keep in mind, um, it's not always guilt. Um, yeah. For some uh, Germans, it's simply uh, that they feel like it should be remembered what happened. It's not, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, it depends really if is that it has that German lived outside his own borders of uh, outside of Germany. If he has so, usually they're way more relaxed about it. Um, but uh, what you shouldn't conflate is that, uh, you know, a in, in a way, a, responsibly, a responsibility to remember. Um, don't equate that to guilt, necessarily. 
because it's not it's it's two yeah. different things and i've seen from from some people that i've met you know that are not from germany they always they conflate it too they think you know germans feel guilty when actually some germans just feel it's important to remember like like i said like uh, bernard i don't feel guilty i didn't do anything i didn't live at that point um but i do think it's very important to remember that war so yeah there you go and, and, and some people, an, for some reason, conflate those two things. But I think we should go on to the next question. Yeah, there's some thing I need to add here. Another point, the culture is very different in the United States and Germany and Austria. Yeah. In, 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 in the United States, they always say, say this, you can be the next president to a child. Yeah. In Austria and Germany, we don't have anything near this. We, have, we, we don't say it this way, but basically our approach to this is if you don't make your homework, you're going to fuck up and end up as a bum in the street. This is our, you can't be the next president speech. This is our, how we approach. This is why we always focus usually more on the negative and, and, and errors and everything. And this is quite completely different to the, to the American approach. So, and Arnold Schwarzenegger is, I think, famous for this. He says, I wasn't born in America. I was made in America. And he makes pretty clear in a way why there's a clear cultural difference in this approach. Yeah. All right. So um, next question. Uh, what I wonder what your view is on the fact Hitler went to fight on two fronts. If he had only focused on Europe at the time, do you think he would be ruling the world and when to go and then go to war with Russia? Uh, I don't know. He didn't. You know, I mean, you can, this is alternate history. We can make an argument for that things would go one way or the other. Um, a two front war is, has always been a bad thing for any kind of, for any Germany that existed or any kind of principality or duchy that has existed. Even if you go back to Prussian history, a two front war was always essentially nearly always an invitation for disaster. Um, well, except for Frederick the Great. Yeah, that's why I said nearly, <laughs> because I remember Frederick the Great. Um, but even he didn't do I mean, he had huge assistance by, by, by the Brits, for example. I mean, monetary assistance. But, I mean, the, the main thing here is, if you look 1940, after the... What, what were the options for, 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 beating, for, for defeating the, the United Kingdom or the British Empire? There were none. Yeah. The Luftwaffe couldn't do it. This was pretty clear. And... And the Kriegsmarine even less so. There were there were basically no operational ships, and even okay, you get you get the, the the various ships, the bigger ships operational, but it's still nothing nearly to match the Royal Navy. Yeah, and just to say, and, guys, and, Operation Sea Line, the invasion. If you're coming up with that now, that was a plan in name only. There was no Operation Sea yeah. Line. It was really just a name, nothing else. There was nothing and, planned. And and the other thing is the the Germans had a huge army, and. And this, and this, they thought they could beat everyone. And actually, I mean, they, they reached the outskirts of, of Moscow, even with very, to a certain degree, with very short in logistical planning and, and various errors. So, so I think this, this is the problem is everyone compares it with Napoleon and everyone thinks the two, um, the two front war is bad, of course, and they, they knew it also. But the thing is, it's way harder actually to beat the British Empire. This is, this is the, the, I think, the main aspect which people don't understand it, that naval strategy is built strategy. And with naval strategy, you're talking usually in decades yeah. to build up that stuff. And, and, and this wasn't there. So, so what were the options for, 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 the, for the German to, to completely um, reduce the army and send everyone in, in Kriegsmarine training camps? Yeah, but there are no ships there. So, so what are you going to do? You, I think they probably would have needed several years. I think during, during the plan of Barbarossa, they actually switched to, to build more warships and planes in order to beat the United Kingdom afterwards because they also needed the resources. This is the an another problem. So this is always, I think, most people think it's way too easy to just invade the United Kingdom, which is actually... Pretty damn hard. Caesar did it. <laughs> Not even. So, yeah. Um, I think we move on to the next one. Yeah, because... um, is the film Battle of Britain from in, filmed in 1969 a good movie? Uh, yes, it is. Especially for, uh, considering the time it was. Then there's a 
Question for you, Bernhard. What is your opinion on Michael's Bay movie The Pearl Harbor? <laughs> I never watched it, but I watched one. I saw one small scene where I noticed that the destroyers in the background were certainly not World War World War Two destroyers, but others. Ah, that, that that can be excused, but yeah, don't watch it. It's it's yeah. a train wreck. Then there's another music question for you, Bernhard. Priest or maiden? I think it's. Oh uh, well, this this is a really a, a really tough one. Um, uh, why or? <laughs> It's of course priest and maiden british steel in any way i would say both of them um now i lost the questions right um i think i caught actually up bismarck and me what do you think about polish air force in the early days of world war ii do you know anything about that well i would say they fought valiantly but yeah against the luftwaffe this was a bit of a tough fight so not much to add here. Yeah, um, they had some credible victories, but um, they were not equipped to handle the Luftwaffe. However, what is very interesting is that their response, or actually their their planning uh, of uh, what would happen or what they would do when Germany invades was actually pretty good. Because the Luftwaffe tried to knock out the Polish Air Force within the first couple of days, and they completely failed to do so. Because the Poles um disperse the air force they use backup airfields which the germans didn't know about and their general response to the invasion was as good as you could probably do it considering the circumstances and i will probably make a video about the polish air force in the early days of world war ii at some point where i will go into more detail it's a very interesting um topic in a way because nobody gives them credit for what they did but actually they they had some forward thinkers right there so um, next one is for you. How how much did you cringe watching the movie Pearl Harbor, especially the Battle of Britain scene? A lot. <laughs> Hammer and, down. Oh, and the next one is also for you. The White Tiger Russian movie is many T thirty four tanks versus one tiger. Okay, that was actually. I not think a I've question. seen that movie, but I'm not sure. So another one for you, Bismarck. What do you think about the mere portrayals of the Vietnam War? It seems to focus a lot more on the nature of the war itself rather than the nature of the victory or the triumph of good or evil. Um, the movies I've seen are generally... Good over good. evil, sorry. Oh, the, the movies I've generally seen about Vietnam are generally good. Um, and probably a, mo a lot more, as you say, into kind of the human element than trying to beef up heroics, which is interesting. It's maybe because it wasn't a war that was won per se by the people that make the movie. Maybe that's the reason why there is more a more human element in it. Maybe also because it's closer to nowadays. So there's a, uh, a more generational link that exists to nowadays. I don't know, but yeah. Um, that question we already had already. Um, what do you think would have happened if Axis won the war? I don't know. I don't know. Um, do I play Warfone or not anymore? Um, <laughs> Next one is for me. Do you, yeah. Do you think some attention should be brought upon Soviet Polish deporting of Germans from East Polish in 1945 to 1948? <sighs> uh, brought up. What's, I don't, what is brought upon, brought upon, you mean? Oh. I, I, I mean, I don't. You see, um, there are quite many border conflicts on the whole world, and actually he is none, so I don't think we should any stick around there, because as far as I know, most people are happy with the settlement right now. And I don't think there is much need to attention to bring to it. I don't exactly know what happened. I mean, I know that Poland shifted way to the west, as did Russia, because Kaliningrad was once Königsberg and is now an exclave of Russia. So if you look at this map, you say, oh, my God. But if you look at the peace we had in Europe and the peace between um, Germany and, and Poland, I said, yeah, it seems we moved on and we, we, de we dealt with it in a very responsible way. We said, OK, we had our differences many times, but now I don't think we need to kill each other anymore, which is, I think, for the Progress. best. Progress. Progress. <laughs> This is the thing. I mean, the other things I'm not so happy with, but I don't have a real problem with how the borders are in Europe right now.
not at all. So, um, um, go ahead. So next one for both of us. Do you believe that history is written by the victors? I don't think so. I think it's written more by political necessity, which can be sometimes in favor of the victor, but also sometimes in favor of the defeated. If you look at the clean Wehrmacht myth, to a certain degree, I believe this was due to the Cold War and that Germany was the new ally of the allies. Yeah. And also for Rommel, for instance, also to surfing, he was uh, brought up so that the the losses, the early losses of the allies were minimized. I mean, I talk about this in the in the Rommel video quite extensively that there are many factors in. And I think this is the same with history. History is written for in in the political what in the political necessity to a certain degree. And and what and and so to just make it a simplification is to say it is the victors. Because, of course, this, fit, this fits really into the underdog story, yeah? The underdog. You, I, I usually, in computer games, I usually try to play the underdog. The guys who lost, I usually play them, yeah? But, and, and everyone, there's some people that always go for the underdog. But I think it's an oversimplification. And I actually had, I think, a video plan on this and a script already written to a certain degree, but maybe, maybe I should dig it out. It's, because... Um... Yeah, I yeah. mean, you, you could push that out, but, you know, one of the things I would say is that history is multifaceted. Um, so in, in some sense, yes, it is written by the victors for a clear purpose. Um, in other sense, however, there is a clear um, distinction that has to be made, you know, how was it written back then and how it is perceived back now. For example, if we talk about the Roman conquest of Carthage, and the Romans wrote it as this amazing conquest that they did, and nowadays we look at it as like, well, they raised a whole city and civilization to the ground. Um, so it can come ba and, and back you ba ba uh, like bite you back in the, in the arse um, if, in that sense. Um, on the other hand, nowadays with how much information sharing there's going on, it's going to be incredibly difficult to write history just from your own narrative because people are exposed or can be exposed if they wish to be exposed, which is probably the bigger problem here, um, to different takes on things um and then of course you also have moments like um well i think it's in caesar's bello gallico where where he talks about his conquest of of belgium yeah Be Galli yeah or the gales or the gallic tribes in northern france where i think he starts out by stating like the belgians or the gaelic warrior is the most fearsome warrior ever like he starts out with a compliment um that is not somebody who who you know goes goes then out and says, oh, these, these people, you know, it, we did so well and they did so poor, you know, that, that is not, maybe it's also to toot his own horn, I defeated these brave warriors, but there is, there, it's multifaceted, and is what I'm trying to say. Uh, um, one, one small detail about um, Gallic, um, I had actually a class on, on um, Roman historiography, mm -hmm. and this thing was actually, uh, I think it was called a material, okay. which the, the commander provided, and it should be used actually as a source for historians back then. Mm -hmm. But I think, I, think, I, think he, I think it was mentioned that, that nobody did it, or it didn't happen in this case. Mm -hmm. It was quite interesting, I think a small tidbit that so, this was actually basically a source he wrote for historians back then. Right. I mean, so, it's something that comes to mind here now, having you said that, um, even though it's centuries later, uh, when Wellington and Blucher defeat Napoleon at Waterloo, afterwards, Wellington in, in, back in the United Kingdom tried to minimize the role that Blucher played in victory. And in, in fact, I, uh, he once got really angry at somebody who made like this model kind of battlefield for including the Prussians. He got really, really angry about that when he saw it. Um, so you can say, oh, you know, there, there is a victor trying to write his own history, but it's very hard to en enforce that kind of stuff. And as we all know now, Wellington failed in enforcing his own vision on things. You know, Blucher came to his aid and together they defeated um, Napoleon. I mean, there's one, one, something I need to add here in general. The thing is, right now we're living in a time where basically Due to the internet, um, yeah, basically to the internet, the nation state lost 
the monopoly on information. Because for a long time, the nation state could make basically have one major narrative or usually one or two, depending on, on the political situation. And now, and, and we are now entering a time where we have a lot of different narratives and everything breaks to a certain degree, uh, um, falls apart and which creates to a certain degree tribalism and, and, and sectionalism, or like, I don't know, it's actually a term or something. So this is very interesting where we're moving right now. This is all, all, of course, created the whole fake news debate and other stuff because it's happening on a, on a way higher scale and basically everyone, everyone can reach everyone. I mean, you should just imagine Bismarck has 70,000 subscribers. Now I have 250,000 subscribers. We are, we are two guys and we just started doing, making videos 30 years ago. This would have been not possible at all. We couldn't even have published a newspaper on our own with our budget and everything and reach more than, let's say, 100 people, maybe maybe 1,000 people at all, but at enormous cost. So uh, this information revolution and what's going on this will have a major impact on many, many things. All right. I think we've both answered that question. Um... Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, do people in Germany look down upon the study of World War II and interest in German tactics and generals during the war? Uh, okay, we, we're probably going to go over this question again and again. Um, I, I, have a, I have a very interesting quote actually here in, right. in what, what's regarded to this. It's from Daniel Stahel, um, Operation Barbarossa in Germany's defeat in the East in the introduction. It would surprise some um, in the English speaking world to learn that although German school children are taught much about Hitler's rise to power and the Holocaust, they learn next to nothing about the campaigns and battles their country fought in World War II. As a result, the name Kursk means more to many Germans as the namesake of a Russian submarine tragedy in which 118 soldiers died in 2000 than as one of the most significant battles of World War II in which many thousands of German and Soviet lives were lost. Well, there think, you go. I think this is pretty much yeah, the, <laughs> the I mean, answer to this. We could beat around the bush with, with that question a lot, but yeah, um, that, that's pretty much a good answer. Um, then there's a question for me. In, in your opinion, what would you consider the best aircraft for the Luftwaffe in World War II? Best being most effective in overall support? Uh, well, in, in the whole war, uh, I mean, it's extremely difficult because you were talking about a changing, changing dynamic of of the air war. I mean, initially, of course, you, you know, how how do you how do you value tactical support, for example, in the invasion of uh, of France over uh, CAP, for example? How do you evaluate um, tactical or strategic bombing over escorting or fighter sweeps? Um, extremely hard, to, you know, to, to say give you a definitive answer there. Um, you, can, you can definitely look at certain time frames and say, okay, this was the best aircraft the Germans had at that point in time in a given role. Um, but then again, the, the, the pool that you're choosing out, of, out there is very minimal as well. You know, you, so for example, I would say initially, um, the B of 109, of course, was the best fighter they had. And yes, they did still, in the invasion of, of Poland and in the invasion of France, they still had other fighter air, air, aircraft as well, older aircraft. Um, but later on, I would say, well, the, the Focke Wolf 190 is getting better a lot. That's a lot better. And then at the end of the air war, then you can go back into a discussion on, you know, is it now the 190 or is it the ME262 and so on. So it's, it's you know, I could go on for ages and ages. Generally, I don't really like this. this I, I will be honest, I don't really like this idea of best aircraft, blah, 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 um, because it's such a complicated issue. And yeah, it's it's just... Yeah, planes hard. are good for certain things they do. And, and you can't really say, well, the Stuka is better than the Heinke 111 and the Heinke 111 is worse than the 109 because, you know, they're, they're designed around different things. Um, so another question for you. What made you so interested in World War II? Uh, airplanes. Good. Um, to either have you seen... Okay, we had that one for both of us. How do you guys feel about the movie Valkyrie and how was it received in Germany? I didn't see it. I didn't watch it. I, I watched it and I remember I went to the, to the counter and asked um, two, two tickets for killing Hitler. 
She smiled, <laughs> she, she, she smiled and said, harm we nicht. Uh, we don't have that. And he handed me the tickets. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> I was in Hamburg with a friend I know back then. So um, how was it received in Germany? I think I can actually see, I think there was a lot of buzz actually because Tom Cruise is with Scientology and and, and, and some other stuff. This yeah, is what I, think I the remember. Buzz was more around Tom Cruise being Scientology and if it's ethically yeah. right to show the movie because of that reason. Yeah, this is like... Because the, Germany is extremely tough on Scientology. Yeah. Which is good. Well, I don't know. It's the, the general issue of Germany and free speech. Yes, I don't of think course. It isn't good. And then this is with that. Yeah. It's... So, um, next one for me. Any chance of a video regarding the division organization or plans? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I will at a certain point revive the, the organization videos. And Bixi, uh, very likely that there will be something on them and maybe also on the organization. But I, I'm basically searching for a new way to make the organization videos that they are more, more cooler in, in a way or more interesting to a general audience, I think. So next one for me, what are your thoughts on the film like Cartoon, which even though are based on real events still in gender controversy today, I, I didn't watch the movie. I didn't know that there's a movie about it so i know about the cartoon massacre but yeah in general also i'm i don't usually watch that much movies and the other thing is um yeah the war crimes issue i yeah yeah if we make a video about that guys it's, it's i mean as, as you saw <laughs> as you saw from from the quote beforehand basically in school you have all the war crimes and all the the holocaust and everything so at a certain point, you just, and there's no military history. For me, I'm a contrarian, so I went, oh, military history, nobody wants it. Yeah, I make a channel about that, in a way. So the other stuff, yeah. And it's, it's important, but it's also not a part for YouTube in this way, unless you are funded, well-funded. Yeah, uh, I mean, before we, you know, we could, we could say so much about that, but before we yeah. do, um, I know a lot of people want the, you know, a video about, you know, these kind of edgy topics. If we do that, our channel might very well be gone and then nobody has yeah. anything. So, I mean, yeah, so that, that's pretty much, I think I would, I would say about that. And then today, um, today did, or today or yesterday, they shipped out a new version of YouTube at my interface. I realized that they also demonetized permanently. So even after review my first April Fool's video, the Reichs Kangaroo. Okay. <laughs> so the Reichs Kangaroo was defunded. And the funny thing is that the icon didn't show up as defunded for a long time. It, it just happened now through the, for the update. I checked all the other videos, all the other videos. It's, it's correct. But in this case, it just showed up. So, so I don't even know because there's clearly nothing in it that's problematic unless you don't get the joke, of course, which could be because it's a fucking AI probably that did the stuff. Manual review, I don't know. All right, let's 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 go on. Um, so this is the uh, same by, by the way, guys, I'm seeing a lot of double, uh, double yeah, double, triple Yeah, please don't double questions. post because, yeah. because it makes everything harder. We are, we are now at 6.30 in the timestamp of the questions, but it's uh, 20 up. 28 minutes later so yeah so we we're, uh, we're working on a delay here and just because we haven't answered your question yet doesn't mean we're not going to answer a question we're not afraid to answer any question just you know give us time um especially because both of us ramble way too much on the <laughs> on everything um <laughs> i think this is one for both of us i don't know if you mentioned this but what's your opinion on video games that take place in historical events all right i'm gonna it's good um, if it's done with a certain amount of respect to the event. So if you're going to invent shit and you don't make it clear that it's fiction, I have a problem with it. Yeah, I, I, I think I go on the same line. So if you make it completely hyperbole, like wool, I don't, I don't have a problem with it all. I, yeah. As I mentioned in the video, I, it's as historically accurate as wielding two assault rifles in, in one hand, basically. And... And I have no problem with that. I have mostly a problem if, if it's, it's really fuzzy and, and then some bullshit gets into it and it's not clear. Yeah. I mean, Battlefield 1 is also where I say, yeah, it's a mainstream title and there are clear aspects where I say, okay, that's obviously bullshit. All right. 
Um, next question. For both of us, what made you guys... Okay, we had that. We had that one. Um... Battle of the Bulge, do you think even if all primary goals were achieved, capturing Antwerp and other, what would the offensive ever achieve anything other than delay the advance? Probably not anything else. Yeah. Um, what do, you th do you think there is an abundance of World War II movies? Uh, there's an abundance of bad World War II movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, How do you two feel about Nazi censorship in Germany? There, well, it's... Uh, again? <laughs> again? <laughs> First of all, what you classify as Nazi censorship is probably not what it actually is going on in Germany. Um, because I've, I've noticed with a lot of people that come from, you know, from not Germany, they have a completely skewed image of what the actual quote-unquote censorship is. There's a couple of websites on the web that actually specifically tell you what you can and what you cannot do. And it's pretty much only uh, about one or two things. Um, like the thing is, computer games is on the list. So, and, and this is what m m most people are concerned. So, in a way, the and we should not forget one thing: Germany is a huge market for computer games, yes. and this basically affects all of the European products, for, for instance. And this is where I think Germany should get the shit together and and make a game make a proper way to to make games more historically accurate because everyone else is also paying the price well i think you know in germany within the next 10 years it's probably going to happen that that video games are considered a, as a form of art or a media and then it can be used yeah well it's, it, it's, it's dependable yeah but it's you know that things like that take time you know what do you expect you know yeah. you just flick at the finger um no, it's not gonna happen. I'm an impassioned asshole. Don't forget that. Yeah, that's, that's true. But yeah, you know, it's I just see this a lot on the internet. Now people, they always say there is a lot of censorship, and there are things you should you should make a video about that. Yeah, and then YouTube will hit me. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> but you know, just you know, go on the internet, search the actual law. You will find it immediately. It's translated into English on official websites, and you will know exactly what it is, and you will notice that what everybody is saying about German censorship is not actually what it, what the reality is. like. Yeah, I think we got it. So next one for both of us. Have you ever heard of the Norwegians in the German army? Will you do a video on it? Uh, I assume they were part probably of the, of a certain, of certain divisions, the Viking, probably the Viking. But I'm not entirely certain. So, and a video on it, um, since it's most likely uh, an SS unit, no. Do you know more? One second. Is Mark? One second. No, no, I'm just cleaning out the chat. There are a couple of. Ah, yeah, I know. Wave. So. Come on, guys, be excellent to each other. It's not hard. I mean, you said Norwegians in the German army. So, well, um, about in the German army? No, I don't know. I mean, no, no, I knew about Grizzling, but this was a politician. Well, uh, well, every occupied country had some sort of presence in the German army. No, not in the army, in the SS. Oh, also in the army. You had volunteer volunteers also in the army. As far as I know, really? I think so. Uh, I mean, there was the there was the Blaue Division, the yeah. Blue Division from the Spanish. I mean, okay, it was not occupied territory, but I don't know. As far as I know, most other units were well, that, that on, the Korean not guy, army for example, units. That for, the Korean guy, he was in the German army in the Wehrmacht, in a reserve battalion that that was on on the beaches in Normandy, and they weren't. Are you okay? Yeah, I mean, for I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more on the. Um, few individuals, but more on units. And with units, I, I usually I I only know about the bl blue division and SS units. So, oh, do you know of any German army units like a regiment or a battalion of of any occupied? Not like this, no. This is the thing. I I think this is the um. I'm I'm thinking of uh, I'm thinking in units, and you thinking in individuals. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, next question. Uh, do we think that the Germans would have won or fought, at least fought longer if they mass produced a single variant like the Soviets did with the T 34? I doubt we had the resources for it. 
Yeah, I think the uh, main problem was non-standardization in German production for quite some time. And yeah, I mean, there was too less focus on, on, on tanks actually. I mean, if they would have switched a lot to production of planes and battleships in 1941, to a certain degree, I don't know. I, I mean, have one or at least fought longer, fought longer. Yeah, I mean, in the end, it would have broken down this way or the other way. So I think with the major blunders still there, with the major strategic blunders like Stalingrad, I don't think the production would have made a change. But if there are certain production changes and also less strategic mistakes, yes, the war could have been fought longer. And one often depends on psychology, what would have happened if, for instance, tanks finally reached a certain point or something. So this is always hard. But I will take a very closer look at this problem one or two years when I know all the shit on the Eastern Front, basically, and make like 50 more videos on the whole topic. Because then I, I can make, can combine certain facts and make and 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 more convincing case for alternative with probably also some numbers and and real look at it. So okay, so there's one last question here. Why do Germans love David Hasselhoff? Well, that's because he's a god walking amongst mortals. That's why. So we had that already. Um, opinion on um, there's one one controversial one again. Again. Oh. Um, uh, opinions on the swastika being removed from Call of Duty World War II. Did, uh, did they also remove it from, from the international version or only from the German version? I don't know. I mean, I, I know that, there is, uh, that the multiplayer mode, I think, feature black Germans and everything. So, because they are, the going is the focus on the, on the, the personal experience of the war of one. So, I, I, to a certain degree, I can say, okay, that, is an interesting aspect, but I I had some I had some I, I need to read up on this again because usually you need to get the facts straight because sometimes there's a lot of bullshit out there. And I probably will make a video on this whole issue when I have proper information. And I I think it's worth it. Somebody is saying that the army that the um, units that were not with Germans were Ostbataillone. From the army. Ah, the Ostbataillone, yeah. So I, I never, yeah, the Ostbataillone, I, I, I actually tried to read up on those in, in, in the Deutsche Reich und der Zweite Weltkrieg, but I, the, I, f I found the information rather, rather thin or unconvincing. It was more on the general side in this case and not enough details. Because I, I read up on those, I think due to Steel Division or something, because I realized I don't know enough about them. And, and then I realized, yeah, I still don't know enough now about them. <laughs> right, there is one last question here that I can find. The, the rest is kind of what we've already gone through. Um, favorite historical video games? Uh, for me, that would be, I mean, historically, for me, it would be probably from the old days, Steel Panthers, which, I mean, it's hard to say. It's, I mean, it's historically mostly accurate for the tanks and everything. And, phew, I mean, Hearts of Iron free with the Black Eyes mod, but I think I said this already this yes. week. <laughs> well, I think probably every live chat too. So they're, 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 I mean, one probably is, is also colonization. I really love Sid Meier's colonization. And I mean, they say it's a training game, but basically what you do is building up, building up an infrastructure to wage war. Yeah. And uh, for me, well, I'm just going to give um, some World War II simulators uh, a little bit of love, and that is IL-2 Cliffs of Dover and IL-2 Battle of Stalingrad, and of course Moscow and Kuban as well. Um, but if you're not into simulators, or if you haven't tried that yet, you know, don't buy them, because uh, you know, they're, they're quite expensive. Um, they, I mean, Cliffs of Dover isn't. Cliffs of Dover isn't, that's true, but you need a stick. Yeah, you need a stick. Uh, I have a uh, huge thank you to Boobies. And I already mentioned to shoot down the pizza service. <laughs> um, Yule, uh, how about Finnish Air War video about it? Yes, there will be. Um, but, you know, things take time. Uh, but yes, there will be. It's on my... I, really ha I already have the title. Well, I think I have the title, but... Um, uh, what, what timestamp are you looking at from the questions right now? 608. 
608? Yes, I'm nearly at the end because I only could find... Uh, okay, I, I, I found, I've, I found one for both of us, that's you. Okay. Speaking of popular media portraying World War II, what are your opinions of Swedish metal band Sabaton and the portrayal of the subject? I don't know anything about it. You don't know Sabaton? Oh of my god. Of course I know Sabaton, but I, I don't, you know, I don't watch their videos, I don't listen to their music, so... I mean... Uh, what I, what I am listen... I supposed to say about it? I mean, I listen to their music and I saw them live three times. Now. Yeah, I think well, three or four times. So, I had to check my spreadsheet to get accurate, but three or four times. Uh, I, I really like the band, the live. The last one I didn't like so much, but this was mostly due to the audience. And um, I think they're doing... A, I, I actually never really reviewed their lyrics too close to see if they are correct. From my impression, they are mostly correct. And of course, there's a little bit more hyperbole and emotion into it, but it's heavy metal. So this is the thing. And I think they, they do a pretty good job because they take a look at, at various aspects and at, at various topics. And this is actually because for, for certain channels, there's the excuse that they, oh, they just they make people interested into history. And, and I would say, well, yeah, if you're a history channel and you, you should get your facts straight and getting people interested in history is, I think, what Sabaton actually does. And since they make basically, I would call music a fictional genre in a way, I think they do a really good job at this because they get really people into, interested in history. I mean, some people, I think, even claim that they remember certain dates thanks to that mm -hmm. and and personal recommendation for everyone one of my favorite songs not from from running wild about a, a famous battle is the battle of waterloo from running wild i think I, I listened to that song i think 20 times in the last two weeks or something it's a really awesome really i don't know it's if, if the information in it is correct but the the impression and the feeling i really love so any recommendation for metalheads Running Wild, The Battle of Waterloo, on the Death of Gl or Glory album. All right. Okay. So... Ah, there's one question for both of us that's really good. Have you seen Die Brücke? Yes. Yes, me too. I, I saw it in, 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 in school. And what are your thoughts about it? Um, you first. It's all right. <laughs> you want to finish it up, right? Well... <laughs> We're trying to be concise, so yes. Ah, uh, yeah, we, we tried to say we finish it. It's one o'clock. Okay, I, I see we are a bit over time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it was really good and gave some good impressions. But actually, have to think about when and we have to close up shop. So right, yeah. So I see there there are a couple of questions coming in now. Um, you will be able to reach us again next Wednesday when we are going to be streaming on Bernhardt's channel, Military History Visualized. Um, sorry to wrap this up now, but both of us are actually attempting to be a little bit more concise with our answers. Um, it's an exercise also for us, so we don't always, you know, say go over the same thing again and again and again. And um, as you all know us, um, we kind of tend to ramble. So uh, we're going to finish this up now. Um, if you have enjoyed what we do, and if you can, if you also enjoy you know this podcast, if you enjoy the videos that we make, please consider supporting us both on Patreon. Um, Military History Visualized and myself are on the platform. Uh, it is completely voluntary, but it does help us a lot to to you know invest more time into into our channels and give us a little bit more independence from YouTube, which does not seem to be overly happy with having us or our kind of content on the platform. Yeah. Um, but for the rest, uh, yeah, I'm just going to hand it over to you uh, and you can take your last minute shout outs or things you <laughs> want to say. Yeah, thank you for watching and see you next time. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.